there, you're very welcome to this episode of Dark Vanishings. Today's episode is about Lars Matang and his bizarre disappearance. The case was recommended to me by one of my subscribers, Hasinan. Thank you, Hasinan, for that. It's an utterly fascinating and baffling case. And in this episode, I'd like to put forward some theories as to what I feel happened to Lars and also uh, some speculation as to whether he's alive or not. So let's get started. Lars Matang was born on the 9th of February in 1986. Lars grew up in Marnie, Germany. We can see here in this piece that Marnie is described as being located in the north of Germany, about seven kilometres from the North Sea. It's described as being a really friendly town. It has a population of about 6,000 inhabitants. An interesting fact about Marnie is that it is the site of Germany's first wind energy plant. Uh, we do know that Lars went on to pursue a career in the energy industry. Lars was an only child and he was utterly devoted to his parents and his parents were devoted to him. His childhood was a loving, secure and happy childhood. On July the 8th in 2014, Lars disappeared from Varna Airport in Bulgaria. He had been vacationing at the Golden Sands Resort in Varna. He has never been seen again. Lars is often described as being the most famous missing person on YouTube. CCT footage from Varna Airport shows him running out of the airport never to be seen again. This footage has been viewed on YouTube over 16 million times. In this video, I'm going to explore a number of factors that combined and, and ultimately led to this disappearance. Lars never made it to check in, he never made it to his gate, and he just vanished, never to be seen again. After Lars left school, he didn't take the usual study path. He chose instead an apprenticeship style degree. He also took a number of advanced classes. He eventually secured a job working as a precision engineer in a power plant located in Willemshaver in northwest Germany. In documentaries and newspaper coverage, Lars is often described as being a regular ordinary guy. But Lars was anything but an ordinary guy. He was in fact an exceptional all-rounder. Uh, he was a high achiever with a strong sense of duty to his family. He was an excellent communicator and extremely sociable. He made friends easily. His friends described him as a kind and funny man who liked to make people laugh. They also described him as a peacemaker. He was a well-built man, fit, strong, and enjoyed outdoor activities such as hunting and fishing. He was extremely sporty. He was also an extremely good looking and striking man. Lars had many leadership qualities that I will discuss in this video. He was very much a leader and not a follower. And I believe that these characteristics may have a significant impact on his chances of survival, even with the set of dire circumstances that he suffered. Lars supported the football club SV Worden Bremen. This was a man who lived a full life. He worked hard, he kept in touch with friends, he loved his family. In fact, prior to his vacation, Lars had been traveling on the weekends back to his hometown to help his mother look after his father who had suffered a debilitating stroke. During these visits, he would also catch up with school friends. According to Google Maps, the distance between Willemshave and Marne was 154 kilometres, a three hour and 10 minute drive. So this was not an insignificant journey to make every single weekend, particularly when you had a heavy, busy job, you had your own life or girlfriend. But Lars would go to any lengths to support his mother and to protect those that he loved. When at home, he would also take the opportunity to catch up with school friends. Lars's mother visited Lars in Willem Shaver and he expressed a desire to her to settle down there, possibly buy or build a house. And as I mentioned, he now had a girlfriend. So things were looking really bright for Lars and he and his mother were navigating his father's health crisis and, and they were there for his father. But it seems that Lars had decided it was time to take a break before he made any further future plans. Uh, his school friends were planning a trip to the Golden Sands Resort 
in Varna, Bulgaria. Uh, one school friend dropped out at the last minute. This wasn't typically the kind of holiday that Lars liked to go on, a kind of sun, sand, sea type holiday, but he stepped in. Perhaps he felt he needed a break. Perhaps his friends encouraged him and they headed off on the 30th of June. Lars's friends said that he was in great spirits. You know, Lars was playing football with people on the beach. Uh, he was relaxed. They were going out at night. The only thing they noticed was that he didn't eat very much. He often skipped breakfast and he ate predominantly soups and salads, which was unusual. The school friends and Lars were staying in a four star hotel in the Golden Sands Resort. It was an all inclusive deal. So most people are inclined to make the most of that kind of, you know, all inclusive eating package and they they eat plenty but apart from that they noticed nothing else out of the ordinary about Lars. During the holiday whilst watching a match in a bar uh, the match was actually part of the World Cup uh, Lars and his friends got into a, a short heated argument with some Bayern Munich uh, fans. Um, it dissipated quickly and they all sort of, you know, patched it up and it ended on a kind of good humoured note. Lars and his friends were the last to leave the bar that night. They headed towards a food area close to the bar uh, and to a sort of a kiosk like uh, McDonald's setup. Uh, his friends wanted McDonald's, but he didn't feel like eating McDonald's. So he declined. And again, the theme of the food, not eating much or eating extremely healthily. Uh, comes to the fore again. We could say that there's nothing particularly unusual about that, but I will discuss this a little bit more uh, later in the video. When Lars's friends emerged from McDonald's, Lars was nowhere to be seen. So they assumed that he had walked back to the hotel. They had a good look around, but they couldn't find him. They were slightly anxious and he didn't show up until the morning and they had no idea where he had been and they didn't really want to pry in too much detail. They were just relieved that he was safe and well. He told his friends that as he walked back to the hotel, he was attacked by four men, some Bulgarian and some Russian, and that they had hurt his ear. He believes that the Bayern Munich fans with whom he argued had put these four men up to sort of roughing him up. He recalled that when they had the altercation in the bar, the Bayern Munich fans said that in Bulgaria, it doesn't cost a lot to hire somebody to sort of rough you up a bit. His friends were really dubious about the story, uh, but the pain in his ear was real. Uh, so something had happened. They weren't quite sure what. His girlfriend encouraged him to visit a doctor to investigate the pain in his ear. The next two nights passed without incidents, but the day before Lars was due to fly home, he decided that he had better get his ear checked, lest he inflict further serious damage by flying. He was concerned about reducing the need to take time off work. So here we see Lars, uh, you know, a, a really responsible guy, not wanting to inconvenience his job in any way. Lars's friend accompanied Lars to a GP who told Lars that he most likely had a perforated eardrum and that he shouldn't fly home immediately. He recommended instead that Lars visit an ENT specialist. Lars's friends wanted to remain behind with Lars. They didn't want to leave their friend in the lurch, but he urged them to go home. He didn't want to put his friends out in any way or, or their employers, he, you know, they needed to get back to work. So he very selflessly told them to go ahead without, you know, him, he would be fine, etc. Uh, they checked out of the hotel in the Golden Sands area and they headed towards the airport. Lars followed behind in the taxi, but he instead veered off in the direction of the hospital to go and see an ENT specialist. The ENT specialist confirmed that Lars did indeed have a perforated eardrum and he prescribed the antibiotic cefaprozil. When Lars emerged from the hospital, the taxi had brought him there was still there. So this taxi driver brought Lars to a pharmacist to uh, get his tablets. The first pharmacist didn't have enough tablets to complete the prescription. So Lars actually had to go to a second pharmacist who did complete the prescription. The taxi then dropped Lars to a hotel called the Hotel Colour. It wasn't in a very uh, salubrious uh, part of town. It's not the fanciest of hotels, but Lars was there uh, just for one more night. It was a cheap hotel 
it would you know do him for his remaining night in Bulgaria uh, Lars thanked the taxi driver for his help gave him a good tip and he then proceeded to head into the hotel colour so Lars checked into the hotel colour and it's at this point that things start to get really dark for Lars he's later captured on CCTV footage pacing up and down nervously in the hotel lobby he also hides in the hotel lift something was seriously awry with Lars Lars would ring his mother and say that he felt uncomfortable in the hotel there was something off about the hotel he wasn't happy about the manner in which the receptionist uh, processed his payment he felt that the receptionist sort of duplicated his credit card details I think it's most likely that the hotel was using the old manual method of processing credit card payments which involved a sort of duplication uh, process uh, or maybe Lars was right something was a little off uh, but Lars was still having many sort of lucid moments at this point and he thought you know what better be safe than sorry he asked his mother to cancel his credit cards and that was a sensible thing to do if he had concerns he also asked his mother to top up his mobile phone which again was a very sensible request because now that the credit cards would be cancelled he wouldn't be able to top up his phone anymore he also asked uh, his mother to transfer money to him because again not having his credit cards uh, to hand this would sort of uh, you know leave him at a disadvantage and he needed ready cash so this is what the old credit card machine used to look like the manual one and you sort of put your credit card in and it was swiped and there was a carbon copy it was a little unnerving it could feel like your credit card was being duplicated uh, you know this is pre-electronic days I, I was wondering could the hotel color have still been using this system it was a cheap hotel perhaps they didn't have everything fully online at that juncture Lars wasn't familiar with it but he did the right thing he wasn't sure and he cancelled his cards his mother also transferred 500 years to him via western union a lot has been made of this amount was he being blackmailed why such an exact amount but apparently she uh, decided to send him 500 years because you know he was injured he had this in ear injury just in case it was an issue with the flight again she also booked him a ticket to travel by bus just in case there was going to be an issue regarding flying the next day a lot has been said that Sandra didn't do enough for her son I think it's preposterous when this is said I, I think she went above and beyond she was cancelling his card she was topping up his mobile phone she booked a bus ticket the exchange between mother and son is just you know you can see the closeness between the two of them he turned to her all the time for everything and uh, he he rang her at one point and said you know I, I feel like my conversation can be heard I can hear everybody else's conversations and Sandra Lars's mother would later claim that you know he was almost implying as if he was being bugged I think again this could be a real sign of a psychological uh, issue with Lars's sense of being spied on you know being bugged uh, but but more on that later uh, the fact is that the hotel colour, the walls are very thin uh, and uh, people can hear conversations across floors. It, it is likely his conversation could be heard. So at one point he was actually whispering when he was talking to Sandra. At 1am he went out for about an hour. He texted his mother to say that he was being followed by four men that he believed wanted to kill uh, or beat him up or rob him, etc. And that he was up high and he was hiding. Uh, she didn't text back for fear or ring back for fear that you know his location would be outed he returned to the hotel settled down a little bit and at 3 a.m he texted Sandra to ask her about the antibiotic what is Cesbril 500 and apologies for the horrendous mispronunciation um, but um, I think that he definitely took the antibiotic when he arrived at the hotel apparently he had wanted to buy some drinks in the shop across the road but there were some guys hanging around that he didn't like the look of so he looked for a drink upon arrival at the hotel Lars the responsible diligent guy most definitely took the antibiotic when he arrived he needed to get his ear better he needed to get back to work and the fact that at 3 a.m he was asking about it I think he was thinking gosh you know is this having an effect on me he he obviously felt like he was uh, a little off
At 3.30 a.m. Lars left the Hotel Colour and frantically waved down a taxi. It was already carrying a woman, but the taxi driver agreed to take Lars to the airport. It was clear that Lars just wanted to get away from the Hotel Colour. He just wanted to get to the airport. He probably felt that once he got to the airport, he was on his way home. The woman in the taxi later reported that Lars' pupils were dilated. I think that this is indicative that at this juncture, something was wrong with Lars, something very seriously uh, wrong with Lars, uh, physiologically and psychologically. Lars arrived at the airport several hours before his flight was due to depart. He contacted his mother to say that he had arrived. He was really relieved. She was also really relieved. So everything was heading in the right direction. Again, lucid, responsible Lars that's always there in the background despite you know the setback he was experiencing. He went to the airport doctor to um, you know, check that he was okay to fly. Apparently he did ask the airport doctor about the antibiotic again. So I think he was again aware that his behavior was a little off and he was trying to get to grips with what was causing this. The doctor described him as being nervous and jumpy. According to the doctor, a construction worker put his head around the door at one point to ask him something. The next thing Lars said, I don't want to die here. And he ran out the door, never to be seen again. And again, here we see him in the yellow T-shirt uh, running uh, frantically out of the airport. Sandra maintains that she was told a slightly different story, that he asked to use the bathroom and he disappeared then, uh, you know, running out of the airport for, for his life. Uh, he cleared a fence uh, near to the airport, disappeared into a field of sunflowers uh, close to a forest and despite numerous searches has never been seen again. I think that the best analogy or the best way to describe Lars's disappearance is as a perfect storm. The Collins English Dictionary describes a perfect storm as an unusual combination of events or things that produce an unusually bad or powerful result. And I think that this is actually what happened to Lars. A series of unusual events combined together to produce this, you know, powerful result whereby Lars literally vanished off the face of the earth. So let's look at the first unfortunate event that befell Lars. Well, I believe that Lars was most likely mugged after he made his way back to the hotel whilst his friends got a McDonald's. And I'll explain to you now why I think that this is the case. So Lars told his friends that he had been beaten up by four men. Some were Bulgarian and others were Russian. I think that it's far more likely that Lars was mugged. Uh, this is an interesting piece in myrpocket.com. It talks about crime and safety in Varna and it says that the most common types of crimes are pickpocketing, car theft, burglaries. They tend to happen at night. Thieves are after cash, smartphones, etc. And I know that Lars's mother, Sandra, she thought that uh, perhaps the style of bag he was wearing, I think it might have had something like an Adidas label, could have attracted attention and uh, made him something of a, a walking target. And I personally agree with her. I think that he was, in fact, uh, mugged. I think that Lars's injuries were consistent with some kind of mugging situation. Uh, this is an interesting piece that I found about Tom Grennan, and it's actually covered uh, across all newspapers. Actually, Tom Grennan is, you know, a really successful singer. He's always storming up the charts, but he endured a, a mugging ordeal in New York. And as a result of being mugged, he sustained a perforated eardrum and also an old injury to his jaw was reawakened. And I did recall reading in some pieces that Lars had also complained of jaw pain. Regardless, both men had a perforated eardrum. And I think that it's likely that Lars was mugged and the injury makes sense. If you think about it, if someone is trying to rip a bag, uh, you know, off your shoulder, wrench that bag off your back, uh, you know, to get that bag, they're going to be sort of punching you in the side of the face, in the ear. And uh, I think that it's very likely that Lars was in fact mugged. This is a very interesting study in the British Journal of Psychiatry. It actually found that uh, in some instances, middle ear disease could actually bring on schizophrenia 
uh, in people. It looked at 84 patients, so it's a relatively small scale study, but the findings are, are very interesting. And it looked at their GP records, basically, and it went back, looked through their uh, medical records, and they found that in a percentage of cases, patients with schizophrenia had had pre-existing middle ear disease. Uh, and that, you know, it had produced uh, schizophrenia. Basically, they, they felt that there was most likely a link there. Um, and you can see it says that in the conclusion, there is an association between middle ear disease and schizophrenia, which may have etiological significance. That just means that they feel the middle ear disease could be producing the schizophrenia. I just thought it was an interesting study to mention because, you know, our hearing is such a primary um, you know, sense, you know, like seeing, smelling, and it's incredibly destabilizing uh, to have any kind of, you know, ear disease, ear injury, like a perforated eardrum. And I personally believe that this ear injury was uh, the beginning of uh, psychotic symptoms in um, Lars. I'm not saying he had full-blown schizophrenia, but he certainly uh, was showing signs of psychosis, I think, pretty early on. Um, like, for example, you know, that four men had followed him and that the Bayern Munich fans had, you know, put these four men up to beating him up. I think he was, in fact, just mugged by men who were not in any way connected to those uh, fans. And those fans, those Bayern Munich fans, were, in fact, cleared uh, by the police authorities. This is a definition from the Mayo Clinic of what a ruptured eardrum is. It defines a ruptured eardrum as a hole or tear in the thin tissue that separates the ear canal from the middle ear. So we can see that a perforated eardrum is very much connected to the middle ear. Um, and I think that it's, you know, a serious injury. It's, it's very destabilizing. I remember when my sister was about 17 years old, she perforated her eardrum and she was in excruciating pain. I mean, she literally had to take two her bed and uh, her balance was affected. I mean, she was just completely, you know, wiped out. And I think that this is what happened to Lars. He got, you know, a fairly hefty ear injury. And I think that it did actually have a destabilizing effect in terms of his mental health. I think he was quite early on starting to show signs of psychosis, for example, saying that the Bayer Munich fans had put up um, these four guys to rough him up. I think that they were actually not connected to the Bayer Munich fans in anyway and in fact the police did clear these fans uh, I think that he was mugged by a separate uh, group of people maybe one or more uh, uh, people so let's look at event number two I believe that Lars was most likely suffering from situational psychosis. Situational psychosis is described here by the International Association of Medical Assistance for Travellers as occurring when somebody is travelling. The change in surroundings, the change of environment can induce psychosis even in people who have no history of mental illness. And we do know from Lars's mother uh, and friends that, you know, Lars had never had any previous history of mental illness. This piece goes on to talk about acute situational psychosis, and it talks about how it can be uh, exacerbated by a, a, a mental or physical condition or you know, injury, we know that Lars had a perforated eardrum. It says that also, you know, circumstances, change of surroundings. We know that Lars didn't typically go on these types of sort of sun holidays. He preferred holidaying, you know, in nature, essentially more sort of naturalistic nature, hunting, fishing, etc. Uh, and it also said that, you know, it can be exacerbated by medication. And we know that Lars, you know, was prescribed an antibiotic. Symptoms include disconnected thinking, disturbed thinking, disorganization, uh, hallucinations, delusions, etc. I think that this factor combined with uh, psychosis induced by the ear injury really, really put Lars in, in a bad way. He was in bad shape mentally. Uh, I also think that, you know, some of the ways that he described Bulgaria, for example, when he claimed that, you know, he was sort of roughed up by four guys and that they were hired by the Bayern Munich fans who had told him that it's easy to, uh, you know, hire somebody in Bulgaria to sort of rough you up or take you out. 
It's possible that they said this, but I think it might reflect a certain fear of his surroundings. You know, he was from Marne, a, a very friendly small town in northern Germany, and this was a, a very different environment. So let's look at the next event that befell Lars. So we know that he uh, was starting to show signs of psychosis after sustaining this ear injury. I believe he also had situational psychosis. And now to just literally uh, sort of really push things over the edge, he now had a side effect from the antibiotics. So this is event number three, the next sort of unfortunate event that befell Lars. This is a very interesting study. It's in brain behaviour, immunology and health, and it looks at psychosis as an adverse effect of antibiotics, uh, you know, as basically as a, a, as a side effect of antibiotics. It looked at 23 major antibiotics and it found that in up to 3.8% of cases, uh, people who were taking antibiotics actually developed psychosis. And I think that we can be pretty sure that Lars was having some side effects from the antibiotic and that he himself was possibly conscious of it. He did text his mother at 3 a.m. in the morning to ask about the antibiotic. He also mentioned the antibiotic to the airport doctor. So I think uh, this is the next unfortunate event in this sort of perfect storm of events that befell uh, Lars. So what was the key outcome for Lars in terms of this series of unfortunate events that befell him? Well, I think that he developed psychosis and that the principal symptom of this was persecutory delusions and persecutory delusions of where you feel you're being followed, someone is trying to kill you, somebody's bugging you or listening to you, uh, somebody's trying to hurt you. And I think that we have lots of evidence, uh, even you know instances I've discussed in this uh, video so far that show that this was very much the case with Lars. This is a very interesting paper. It's Advances in Understanding and Treating Persecutory Delusions. And it looks at uh, a range of papers and it actually states that in 70% of first episode uh, psychosis patients, there is the presence of persecutory delusions. So I think that we can be pretty certain that A, Lars had a first episode uh, psychosis because he had no previous mental illness and B, that persecutory delusions was um, or were uh, a key uh, principal symptom of this. This is an extract from the review on persecutory delusions that I was just discussing and you can see where the arrow is. It says that at first uh, episode of psychosis, over 70% of patients have a persecutory delusion and it is the type of delusion most likely to be acted upon. So we know this to be true because Lars felt unsafe in the airport. He acted on his instincts, even if his perceptions were delusionary and he decided to get himself to safety. It goes on to say that persecutory delusions are a common clinically important psychotic experience for which treatments need to be significantly improved. And I thought that was an interesting fact because we have to remember that Lars saw three different medical practitioners. He was also at a pharmacist and nobody picked up that this man uh, may have been delusional. At one point, Lars described being mocked by the ENT specialist. Was Lars actually showing signs of psychosis at this point in front of the specialist? And perhaps the ENT specialist didn't realise the gravity of the situation. He sort of mocked him, maybe thought he was a silly tourist that had just got into a drunken brawl or altercation or whatever, not realising that Lars was now manifesting early signs of psychosis. There are lots of articles in the medical literature, both professional uh, and academic, that talk about debilitating memory loss as a result of psychosis. I have absolutely no doubt that once Lars left the airport, his deterioration included not just persecutory delusions, but also memory loss. Lars was devoted to his family. There is absolutely no way that he would deliberately stay away from his family. I think that it's likely that within a day or two of leaving the airport on that fateful day, Lars no longer knew who he was and that this was part of his uh, psychotic condition. But there is another possible event, event number four, or actually it should be positioned as the very first event. Is it possible that Lars was showing signs of mild depression before he arrived in Varna? Something that's very significant 
is that Sadra, his mother, said that she didn't even know he was taking this holiday. This sounds really, uh, you know, very unusual for Lars. They were, you know, so close. They communicated a lot, as we could see uh, throughout this whole ordeal for Lars. Uh, you know, he and Sandra were in constant communication. So it was odd that, you know, he, he didn't tell her from the outset that he was going on the holiday. Another thing as well we have to remember is that he had endured some big life stressors, you know, new job, he had moved home, there was a major illness in his family. His friends did note that he hadn't been eating well in Bulgaria, he'd been skipping breakfast, uh, eating mostly soups and salads, etc. And again, this might have just been a, a sign that, that all was not well. Was he suffering from maybe low grade depression? He had a lot on his plate. He pushed himself very hard. He was that kind of a guy. He wanted to be there for people. And perhaps it was something that his friends weren't even conscious of or that Lars was even conscious of or his family. It was very much internalized, very much a low grade, mild depression. But it could have been there, which made the subsequent events uh, that followed with the ear injury, you know, the new situation, the new environment, uh, it, it put him in a kind of danger zone, if you like. Something else that I would like to mention is that I believe that Lars was also suffering from perfectionism. A lot of people who knew Lars described him as being extremely orderly, you know, fastidious. Uh, he was a high achiever. You know, he never let anybody down. He he exacted high standards of himself. But this piece on BBC.com says that actually this kind of a personality can be very vulnerable to health problems, including mental health problems in the long run, because if things become messy, you know, as occurred in Varner, you know, things are out of your control. You could see that throughout this whole situation, Lars was desperately trying to get on top of this situation to keep control. Um, you know, people who are perfectionistic, you know, it, it, it can be very uh, debilitating for them when, you know, life sort of spins out of control, if you like. This is a very interesting article about perfectionism and the psychological side effects of perfectionism. It even talks about perfectionism extending to, um, you know, eating disorders, things like orthorexia, where you're, uh, you know, sort of obsessed with eating very clean food, etc. So again, I think that Lars's personality sort of tended towards this end of the scale in terms of exacting very high standards of himself, which made all these, you know, very messy, unpredictable events that befell him particularly difficult to cope with. There are other possible reasons for Lars' disappearance, so let's have a look at them. This is a piece in The Guardian about two fifths of UK trafficking victims being male. And the statistics are from Salvation Army findings and these men and women were being, you know, sexually exploited. Lars was an extremely striking and good looking man. Was it a, a possibility perhaps? that he was in fact being pursued by men who wished to traffic him. I personally feel that this isn't the case and I'm, I'm ruling out this uh, possibility because I think that his injuries are far more consistent with a mugging injury. Another theory that has been put forward about Lars is that he was possibly carrying drugs uh, uh, through the airport or attempting to either on his own initiative or under duress perhaps the gang that had you know apprehended him had forced him to do it but no drugs were found uh, in his bag uh, this is a man that wouldn't even eat a McDonald's let alone ingest drugs some people thought that you know this was one of the reasons why he ran out of the airport perhaps the doctor was sort of on to him and was going to search him and he just fled and I can see how people could see, you know, there's a possible drug meal situation. Uh, drug meals can look very wary, very paranoid. They're obviously afraid of being detected. This is how they're uh, detected. And we could see the paranoia in even his body language, you know, Lars, as he moved through the airport. He was, you know, uh, very wary. But I believe this was due to psychosis, um, due to the events that had befallen him, the mugging, uh, you know, the ear injury, the side effects of the antibiotic. I, I don't believe it, it was in any way connected with the 
you know, drug mule, uh, you know, possibility that has been put forward. And I believe that if he was a drug mule, the last thing he would have done is he he would not have visited a doctor's uh, room if he was a drug mule. So I think that there is absolutely no credence to this particular theory. So finally, could Lara still be alive? So to understand Lars's chances of survival, we need to look at the worst case scenario for Lars and work backwards. So we know that he had psychosis most likely and that possible memory loss was also potentially in the mix. Um, but let's say his condition actually morphed into full blown schizophrenia. What is the mortality rate like for somebody suffering from this debilitating condition? Well, this is a study in the Journal of Psychopharmacology. And in the first line, you can see there it says the life expectancy of patients with schizophrenia is reduced by between 15 and 25 years. So let's explore why that is. Here is an extract from that study on premature mortality and schizophrenia and it says at the very top that suicide and accidental deaths account for up to 40% of all deaths in schizophrenia and it's not hard to understand why somebody experiencing you know persecutory delusions etc could be vulnerable to accidental death. Lars has run out of an airport, he's no ID, no money, he literally just has the clothes on his back. If you come down a few lines it says a large Finnish study in first admitted patients with schizophrenia showed significantly increased risk for suicide in patients not receiving antipsychotics. So Lars, in my opinion, was suffering from psychosis and it wasn't being treated. So this does put him at risk of, you know, suicide, whether he did it immediately then or would have done it subsequently, but it, it could potentially be a risk. But we now have to add another factor into the mix. Not only was Lars psychotic, but he was also homeless. So how do you fare if you're also, you know, somebody who's homeless and you, um, you know, also have a serious mental health disorder? And this is a very interesting study in ACTA Psychiatric Scandinavia, and it looks at mortality amongst homeless people with schizophrenia, and it's a 10 year follow up study. So this is a serious uh, study in terms of looking at this issue over the long term. So what were the findings of this study on homeless men with schizophrenia in inner Sydney? Well, it was found that homeless people in inner Sydney have death rates three to four times higher than people in the general population of New South Wales. And I think none of us would be surprised by that. Living on the street must be incredibly difficult. But an interesting finding was that men with schizophrenia uh, didn't show any elevated risk as a result of their schizophrenia. And I think that gives a glimmer of hope that uh, you know people with mental health illness somehow and in some way uh, often survive quite well on the uh, streets and uh, again this this could augur well for uh, Lars. So here is an example of this very phenomenon Canadian man Anton Philippa, who was schizophrenic and also homeless, had been missing for a number of years. He turned up in the Brazilian Amazon. He had covered a, a distance of 10,000 miles on foot, hitchhiking, etc. Uh, and he defied all the odds. He had schizophrenia, he was homeless, and he was found alive and well. In a strange twist of fate, he looks very like Lars, and for a moment, Sandra thought that it could possibly be Lars. So it was a happy day for Anton's family but sadly uh, not a good day for, for Sandra. So here we see this beautiful photo of Anton reunited with his brother and I'd really love to see a photo one day of Lars you know reunited with his mother and his family members. I mean it would be incredible. I still feel there's a lot of hope. So let's go back to Lars's chances of survival. I believe that Lars most likely climbed higher. We have to remember that when he texted his mother and said he was being followed by men, he told her that he was up high and safe. I think that because of his persecutory delusions, his instinct would have been to climb higher. And we have to look at the actual terrain of Bulgaria. It's one of the most mountainous countries in the world. Here in peakvisor.com, it says that Bulgaria has 4,950 named mountains. And actually some of these are around Varner. I think it would have given him the cover that he needed. Um, you know, perhaps there are streams and rivers that would have, uh, you know, flown from some of these mountains with fresh water. 
uh, he could have hunted, etc. And I think that Lars's instinct would have actually taken him higher. And this may explain why Lars has never been found. This is an interesting piece in The Guardian about a man called Christopher Knight, who disappeared uh, deliberately uh, in a remote area in Maine, uh, a remote trail. Uh, he was tired of the world, wars, he was tired of people, you know, he wasn't getting on with people. He just, you know, he found it challenging. Life was challenging for Christopher and he disappeared for 27 years. But he said that one of his chief issues was obviously hunger. And this forced him close to inhabitants, even in this remote uh, environment. So he would steal food from cabins, etc. And this is how he was eventually apprehended and found because he was arrested for stealing uh, from one of these cabins. So I think that Lars most likely went up high. But again, no man is an island um, and he may have been forced to make contact with someone or steal food, etc. And I think it's possible that he could be living, you know, with somebody, uh, elderly couple who knows or, or you know, a, a man living on his own in the wild, who knows, in a cabin. Uh, he could be in that kind of a scenario. Uh, and not the scenario that is actually discussed about Lars quite a bit, that he's been seen in Dusseldorf, etc. I just have a suspicion that he could still be closer to Varner than people may think, but at a higher altitude. You know, he may just be in mountain terrain and may have felt safer in an environment like that. And one thing that is a blessing for Lars is that, you know, he was good at fishing. He was a strong man physically, he was an intelligent man. And uh, I think that this is a far more likely scenario for Lars. So these are interesting statistics from Statista. You can see here that um, in 2011, rural households um, in Bulgaria, only 31% of them had access to internet, meaning that 69% didn't. And we have to remember that Lars went missing in 2014. Um, by 2021, the situation has improved. 62% of rural households had internet access, but there's still a very significant percentage, 38%, uh, that doesn't have internet access. And I believe that Lars is most likely in rural area, possibly mountainous. And I, I think that perhaps where he is, you know, the inhabitants, they, they don't have, you know, internet access. And it's very possible they don't know who he is. And uh, this may explain why Lars uh, hasn't been detected. In fact, the spots uh, close to Varner that doesn't have internet access, they, these could be good places to search for Lars. So this is a picture of Lars's mother. I mean, oh my God, my heart goes out to her. It must be, you know, just literally the stuff of nightmares. And you could tell how close they were and what a great mother she is and a great son he was. And I really do hope that they are reunited. I believe that perhaps the uh, thing to do now is just to extend the search upwards rather than wider geographically, maybe just go higher. I, I think that he could potentially be in a mountainous area and perhaps drones could help with this. I know that the family did use drones initially in their search. I still think that there's a huge amount of hope and I'd love to see these, you know, really two wonderful people, um, you know, be reunited. And, and of course, you know, Lars with the rest of his family. Um, and, and I think there's still a lot of hope for that. This is an image of what Lars may potentially look like now. You can see the one on the right there with the beard, etc. His weight and height details are there. It's possible that he might be a little slimmer now, you know, if he's sort of living off grid, it's possible that he would be a little bit slimmer. There are contact details if you ever uh, see anything. And uh, I still, as I said, believe that there's a lot of hope and, you know, that Lars could very potentially uh, turn up and uh, or be found or discovered and, and, and be reunited with his family. Thank you so much for watching this video. I really appreciate your support. I cherish every comment, uh, subscriber, um, you know, like. It really means an awful lot to me and uh, I really enjoy producing these videos and uh, I appreciate you watching and thanks so much and I'll see you in the next video.